All right, welcome to Bram Radio, episode number 27 already. Look at you guys cranking them out. Uh, behind the scenes, this is what happens. They come to my office. They say, we're ready for you. I come in here. I sit down in front of this thing, start talking, and then I have no idea what happens after that or before it. It's pretty fantastic. Um, again, thank you to Emrod and Soundbreaking Ground for that awesome soundtrack and lead-in that you guys love so much. I always hear about it. So um, today, something unique, longtime friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine from here in town, this guy has... I'll let him describe it, but what he has done in the Latin community here in San Diego, as far as is is reaching them, uh, getting them fired up for the Lord, getting those guys, it, and and not just here in town, but but all over the country and in Mexico, it's 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 fantastic. I want you guys to meet my friend, Pastor Sergio De La Mora. Woo! Yeah! Stunning. Welcome back to Sergio. Stunning the intro, bro. Yeah, man, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's man, we've to... known each other for, it's, um, I'd say, um, 2009, I think I met you for the first time. Uh, 2008. And they... Pastor Keith. Yes. At, uh, out at Pastor Keith Crafts Church out yes. in um, uh, Frisco, Texas. Frisco, Texas. Yes, when he that did the was men's fun. event. Did the men's event? That's 2008 already. Yes, just like that. Oof, just like that. Oh man, so that's a that's a long time. That's what 15, 16 14 years. Years. Fourteen years. Is that right? Fourteen years. Yeah. Yes. That's a long time, man. Yes. And um, through that time, you and I have both gone through a whole bunch of transitions, a bunch of. Right ins and outs and ups and downs and 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 awesome stuff but through it all man here we are and god is faithful god is faithful yes god yes faithful. sir yes sir welcome to the podcast um it's uh it's awesome to have you off just recently on yours road to restoration Woo-hoo! i love that one that was a that was a blast we had a good time if you guys haven't checked out road to restoration um, you need to you need to go and check that out. It's on all the platforms. It's on it's on pretty much everywhere you can get a podcast. That's yeah. where so I can actually say wherever you get your podcast. So go in and uh, and and check that out. You, you did really good. To- you talked about mental health, and and you were very specific. A lot of guys don't know how to talk about mental health. You did a fabulous job. Well, thank you, sir. I think when it comes to mental health, I think the reason why people don't want to put specifics on it or they don't want to get in it is because it still has some bit of a of a taboo kind of feel to it. They don't want it because they think it's weakness because that whole I got to be I got to be hard. I got to be mentally, you know. Yeah. Some of the hardest dudes I know struggle with aspects of mental health. And even those guys, they're getting to the point to where they're saying, yeah, now it's time for me to now it's time for me to, to, to talk about it. But. The good news is that those guys also have a tribe, you know, and so that is a huge aspect, a huge component to the mental health game is do you have a support structure that that you can go to and say, I have a problem and they're not going to judge you for it? I think that's you talked about that on the podcast about the importance of a tribe. And these days people aren't tribal anymore. Everyone's doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And that is a spiritual strategy of the enemy. Yes. Isolate yes. so you could dominate. Yes. Which, oddly enough, okay. amazing segue. <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today, actually one of the, probably the primary thing, because we could, we could fill, we could do, we could sit here in these two chairs all day long and still only scratch the surface of this topic, which is spiritual warfare. Wow. And, 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 wow. and, and, and this, this podcast is like not one of those, podcast where we we go and we're just beating people with the family bible we're not do we don't really do that here somebody we have guys sitting in that chair they're just letting bad words rip and we put it up you know because they're communicating their stuff and they're doing it their way and and we're just good with it but today i want there i want it to be different today um here we talk about Jesus. I talk about Jesus. We talk about the importance of God in our lives. We do that here on this podcast. Today, I kind of want to get in it. I want to stay in it the entire time because there we are coming up on a on an era of this country, the people in this country, 
uh, are are right now up against one of the biggest seasons, one of the biggest seasons of battle that we've ever had internally in this country. It's left versus right. Somehow it's just turned into some kind of there's a there's there's racial stuff going on, which that's new to me. And I'm both races that are that, that are that brought up the most. Uh, there is it's it's uh it's red versus blue it's urban versus versus uh um versus rural it's all these different there's there's all it, it, it's it's almost as like the enemy has taken our country and has tried to pit as many opposition oppos, uh, opposing points and internal divide is the beginning of let's say the biggest call to battle, I would say the beginning of the end, but I don't think so. I think it's the beginning of the biggest call to battle that we've ever had in this country, and I don't mean the physical war. I'm talking about the war that's happening inside of every man for their heart because when wow. that changes, when there is a heart revolution, yes. when that begins to adjust, then all of a sudden people start looking at things different. They start looking at their opposition different. They look at their opposition as this is my battle is not against the flesh and blood. It is not against that person. It is not. It is it is what Ephesians six says to be aware of what the enemy is trying to do. And then I'm going to put on my my kit, my issued armor, my battle armor, my helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth, my my boots of preparedness, my shield of faith, and I'm going to carry around this sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, for which there is no sheath, because it is supposed to be in your hand moving at all times. And when it's moving, the it sounds like it's, it, it, it's terrifying to the enemy, just the sound of that thing cutting through the air in preparation for confrontation. And that is not happening in every home across this country. It is happening in select places that has been enough to this point to keep the enemy in its corner. Yeah. But he's starting to come out of this corner. Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts on spiritual warfare. Number one, uh, you talked about the political divide. That is a strategy of the enemy. He wants you to either be focused on the agenda of the donkey or the agenda of the elephant. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that it's time that we get committed to the agenda of the lamb mm. and, and the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And the truth is you'll never win the war by um, surrendering to either one. Only Jesus can set you free in spiritual warfare. Um or I know when you look on television, you look at the news, Jeff, it is so easy. You don't have to go, a blind man can see that we're in a political divide that is more than political. It's a, it's a divide of values, morals, ethics, um, philosophies, uh, worldviews, because it has come down to you're either going to um, embrace conservative values or you're going to embrace liberal values. And this come to the front because the days are evil. Uh, all you have to do is look at the news, look at the prophecies, how close we are to the second coming of Christ. So the enemy knows that his days are short. Mm -hmm. So he's obviously ramped up the warfare and has become more visual. More, he's, he's emboldened. He doesn't care anymore. Music, culture, um, things are being said now in songs that you would have never heard before. Yeah. And why? It's because... It's an all-out war. Yeah. And we you talked about um, in every home, there is a war going on. And in the heart of every man, there's a war going on. Mm -hmm. it's, they just may not know it. But that war is a war for who's going to own your heart. Mm. Who's going to be the center? Who's going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be the king, the president uh, of the home that you're in? Yeah. Whether you're a single man, a married man, um, a grandfather, the reality is that if Satan can get the heart of the man, he can get the heart of the home. Yeah. And so that battle is real. I wonder if if, if it's the enemy's number one thing to try to get a hold of. I mean, it's, it's the heart, of course. But the way that he's able to get that is through time. Yeah. Because somebody doesn't manage their time. I remember, oh, man, this is probably five years ago. Man, I was all over Instagram. I was, I was saying, how many likes? How many, I mean, I was playing that game. I was like, what am I doing? 
Like, this is ridiculous. So I, I, I killed all my social media because I looked on my, I looked on my algorithm and I learned that I was spending 23 minutes a day. And of that 23 minutes a day, I was looking at people's, what they had for dinner last night. And I was looking at stupid videos and pictures of their cats, right? I don't care what you had for dinner last night. I definitely don't care about your cat. Why am I sitting here spending 23 minutes of day giving it to something that doesn't rate anything that's in my life? So what I did is I killed all my social media, and I decided that at 23 minutes a day, that is nothing. There are some people out there that that's all they do. And so when I tell this story to people, they're like, 23 minutes a day, that's nothing. Well, that tells a story in itself. So I decided, to look, so 23 minutes a day over the course of a week, that's about, that's a couple hours over the course of a week. So I stand, I decided to take an hour or two hours of my time and handwrite a letter to somebody that I care about, telling them what I feel about them, how I feel about them, what it, what they mean to me. And then you package it up. You write that and that address on the envelope and you send it off. It didn't take but three days. I'm getting a phone call and there's somebody on the other end, nearly in tears. And they all said the same thing. I can't believe you took the time to write that letter. So I took something that the enemy was trying to take was my time of dist- in, in distraction. And instead, I took that time and I started using it to try to in, enable or, or increase in a relationship. I didn't look at it as spiritual warfare. I didn't look at it as something that I was taking away something. I was taking a tool away from the enemy. I never thought of it that way. I was just trying to just not be on social media. And I knew that I was better than somebody who would, I was better than the the version of me that would sit and look and, and just stare at, at social media. But as I started getting feedback from people, I started, I, it, 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 it hit me. And, and so now we're doing social media again because we have the podcast and all the other things that, and sometimes I find myself like going down the rabbit hole, looking at those stupid raccoon videos, which are my favorite. I love the raccoon videos. <laughs> you know, Sam will send me every once in a while one of some dude just ripping on a base, you know, so those are fun. Of course, skydiving videos and things like that. But then I start I start thinking, yeah, these are great. These are great. And there's some great content out there, too, like content that you're putting out there. Yeah. Fantastic. There is some stuff to learn when you're doing that. But as I started diving into this stuff, I started to, I started to say that there is a there is a decrease in the ability of people to increase. There's a decrease in the ability to increase in relationship. And that's done through time. The amount of time you spend with your wife, the amount of time you spend with your kids, the amount of time you spend with the people who are important to you and the people you should be sowing into. Yeah, spiritual warfare is seen in different ways. You're right. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely seen in time because the enemy will take away time. And the Bible says we should redeem the time. Mm-hmm. But another place where spiritual warfare is seen is in our relationships. And I think one of the ways the enemy hurts relationships is through this word called assumption. Assumption. Assumption, I think, has been the enemy of more relationships that we want to be honest about. Because most of us in our mind, we assume things about other people. Like when I saw you, where where did I see you again? Was that at a coffee shop? By where did I see you just recently that we reconnected? Coffee shop in Chula Vista? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Is that yeah, yeah. I think it was at a coffee shop. Yeah. And we just started talking. Right. In my mind, I could have assumed, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. You're not going to say hi to me or talk to me or be open with me. Right. The actual opposite happened. Right. Had I let that assumption become my primary thought of you, I would have maybe avoided you, maybe said, oh, I think I have to go to the bathroom, or I don't want to talk to Jeff. And that's what happens to a lot of people. Yeah. We assume things about them. And usually assumptions come from what other people have said. So if X person says this to me, Y person says to me, then my Z thought is you're like this Mm -hmm. without me first encountering you. Mm -hmm. And so that creates mental warfare. That assumption creates an opinion. So instead of engaging you with an open heart, vulnerable heart, I already have prejudices. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even have a chance. You don't even have a chance because I already made an assumption. And so this is the warfare. Just because you think it, you tend to believe it. The devil can't cause you to make a decision, but he can 
so thoughts into you that will form a decision. Mm. Like you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop a bird from making a nest on your head. So one of the ways the enemy gets people and gets us is through relationships by giving us thoughts about people that are incorrect. So we have to constantly filter our opinions and perspectives about people, first of all, based on the Word of God, not even based on experiences. Because if I base my relationship with you solely on experience, then I'm going to refer to an experience I had with you 14 years ago. and said, based on who Jeff was 10 years ago, I'm going to choose an opinion. The problem with that is that we leave no room for grace, no room for forgiveness, and no room for people's maturity mm. that I've grown out of such and so. Right. So it's important when that we're aware if we're going to win in our relationships, we have to watch more spiritual warfare plays a big factor, creates an assumption. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm assuming things, what do I do? I have to filter that through the Word of God. So, you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 2, verse 16, that I have the mind of Christ. So what does that mean? I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, 16. It says, I have the mind of Christ. So that tells me that I can think like Christ. And what gives me the audacity to say that? Because the Bible says when I become a Christian, I receive the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, how can someone know the thoughts of God unless they have the Spirit of God? Mm -hmm. And the Bible says because we have the Spirit of God, we too have the mind of Christ. That means I have the ability to think how Christ thinks about the people around me. And Jesus ain't going around judging people. Jesus coin isn't going around looking at the worst parts of people. Jesus isn't going around looking at the failures of people. What Jesus is doing is seeing the best, even though they've done the worst. Mm. See, I, I read this quote, and, and I wanted to repost it. It says, the devil uh, knows us, doesn't call us by our name. He calls us by our sin. Mm -hmm. God knows our sin, and yet calls us by our name. Yes. So let me say it again. The devil knows our name, but will call us by our sin. God knows our sin, but will cause, call us by our name. Come on, somebody. Well, see, no, they got to say that. Yeah, they got to say it here. Come, come on, on, somebody. Come on. <laughs> no, but, but the, the thing is, that is, a, that is the mind of Christ. Yes. He sees our worst, but he calls us by our best. So that helps our relationships. Yeah. That breaks you through the warfare, through all of the jungle of ideas and and the enemy's mm. traps, mm. assumptions, judgments, opinions, offenses, so that when we see people, we're constantly clean in our mind. Yeah, I had a I had a a, a, a teammate here recently going through some is going through some terrible stuff. It's going through things that that any that no young man should have to endure and it is just tearing him apart so he and i on this weekend i found him i took i pulled him aside for for i think it was on friday i pulled him aside for about for about 20 minutes pulled him aside just an empty room and just sat down with him and and, and i began to just just breathe some word of God over the top of the tiny little spark that he's been reduced to because it never goes away. Yeah. It's always there. Yeah. A little bit of O2 across that, and it turns into a flame. And I was watching him as I began to speak life into him. All of a sudden, his eyes got a little brighter. They started filling up with tears, but they got a little brighter. He started kind of sitting up a little bit taller because somebody was believing in him for a minute. Fully relational. It was a relational moment yeah god's going to use relationships to to increase to show favor he's going to use relationships to lie to you yeah. not, he's not gonna the enemy is going to use relationships to lie to you it, most failures that are going to happen in someone's life are going to be at the hands of a relationship always but successes are also going to be at the hands of relationships. Always. That's where exactly what you're saying is that there's this weird dichotomous that happens where you have to like, where are you going to go? You have to choose well the people that are going to be in your life. I have men in my life that are going to call me on my BS. I am 
positive. Yeah, right? the, and you know what, Jeff? The thing is, you have to know what qualities to look for. So, let me give you yep. let me give you a quality that I tend to um, refer to when I let people in my inner circle. Anyone that is strengthening a weakness in me that God's trying to deliver from me, I, I put a question mark on that people on that person. There are people that will come into your life. Say that again. Say that again. There are people that will come into your life that will strengthen a weakness God is trying to deliver you from. Mm. Trying to get delivered from alcohol? Watch your friends that come into your life that drink. They come sometimes to strengthen a weakness in you that God's trying to deliver you from. You and I have had that discussion a lot. Zach and I have had that discussion. Yeah, so the question is, you want to, you want to, you want to be able to, because we're talking about spiritual war. You want to be able to identify where there's warfare. Identify the people in your life mm-hmm. that are strengthening weaknesses in you mm-hmm. that you should be getting set free from, that you need to be free from, that God's trying to and deliver I, you from. So, so to qualify, it's Oof. not a weakness. In other words, like my weakness might be I might I'm not really set up empathy wise. But I mean, no, that is something you probably need to strengthen. What you're talking about are things that moral are issues, moral issues. Yeah. So it's it's like those are things that not not character traits that you probably should maybe believe maybe work on. Maybe you, uh, yeah, you uh, you you maybe. probably should spend maybe work on. S- spend a little bit of. Spend a little bit of time trying to reconnect yeah. with your wife. Maybe that's your weakness. Maybe you should. No, no. Talking about things that the enemy has lied to you about, roads that you have gone down, decisions that you have made, which are going to be your demise if you don't get them out of your life. Well, you said one right now. Like any, okay, any person that comes into your life that seeks to weaken the relationship between you and your wife is an absolute enemy. Mm-hmm. Most guys, we will entertain relationships that would become controversial, perhaps even compromise, even perhaps weaken to some degree our relationships with our spouses, simply because we say, I got it. But I've had to learn this the hard way, man. I've had to learn this through losing my family, losing my marriage, losing the people in the life that I, that I thought were precious to me. Simply because I allowed people to come into my life who strengthened a weakness that I had with my spouse and strengthened it by giving me an option or by saying, it's not as bad as you think, or it could be like this. I'm just telling you right now, Jeff, There are people watching this podcast right now. They're in trouble and they're about to get in trouble because they're allowing him to talk to you. You know, think about a woman who allows a man to say, oh, you're so beautiful every day, but her husband doesn't say it. So in her mind, she's like, well, you know, well, he doesn't say it. So it just feels good that someone is saying it. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're allowing that man to strengthen the weakness that is in your marriage. Mm. That you need to take responsibility for with your husband. Mm-hmm. Equally think with a man. Oh, it's so she she understands me. And then oh, she's strengthening a weakness in yep. you to feel understood that you need to deal with with your spouse. So that's how war yep. comes in. The enemy will bring a person. Well, think about Samson and Delilah. Mm-hmm. Delilah strengthened a weakness in Samson that God was trying to deliver out of yes. Samson. So if you have a money problem. Think about your friend that all they talk is money, money, gains, gains, stack, 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 money, money, money. And all of a sudden you go home and you start telling your wife, I'm going to take that second job because you know what? If we're going to come up in life and she's looking at you like, I don't even see you with the job that you have now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what happened? That friend in your life started strengthening a weakness in you. About your need to rise up and make more money. Yeah. But what he doesn't know is that the weakness in your relationship is a greater weakness than your financial weakness. I'm just saying, warfare, the enemy is a student. He's been studying us since the day we were born. However, 
He does the same things over and over against us. I don't know why it is sometimes you have for just so we don't get it. His temptations are the same. His his strategies are the same. I just think that the only way we get it is by slowing down and letting God's word and the spirit of God become the final authority in our life. That's another podcast, but I have been there on in everything you have mentioned. I always tell people it's like I I'm I'm the least judgmental guy you've ever met because you're probably not going to make a mistake that I haven't made. And and these are young guys that are that are in my life that that were that I'm I'm walking through stuff because I'll always tell them I'm like I want to be careful of that. You might not want to do that to you. This is just an old man telling a young man, but I'm telling you that I am the dude who has the armor that looks like it's been kicked down some stairs. Looks like it's been smacked by a sword or two, but I came back from the battlefield. That's the guy you want to listen to. And I am telling you right now, what you're doing isn't going to work. And here's why. And I can always tell the ones that are going to be, they're, 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 they're long game players are the ones that you can see it in their eyes. You can see it click and they're like, check, got it. You can also tell the ones that are like, I'm good. And those guys love them just as much. Um, I just watch them as as time goes on, oh. begin to create some distance and start start to move start to move move away. But I will always have that conversation with them. You have two warriors standing in front of you. One of them, square jaw, his muscles have muscles. Brand new gear, brand new gear, and he has all the cool verbiage and knows all the good stuff to say. The guy over here, he's a dude with angry eyebrows and he's leaning in. And he says many, he says fewer words than the other guy. But this guy is a minimalist with his armor. He knows exactly which armor he needs. He knows exactly, he doesn't have the stuff on there that he doesn't have to have. It's all absolutely needed gear that he's wearing. And every bit of it looks like it has been been just thrown down a set of stairs and smacked around a lot. Which guy do you want to listen to? And the guy's like, uh, I'm not sure which one. I'm like, you always want to listen to the old guy that has beat up armor. Because how did that armor get like that? How did that guy get the scars on his heart? Yeah. How did that guy get, how, co- how comes that guy look like he's been to a battle? Because he's already been there. How is it that he's standing in front of you right now talking about it? Because he's go- he's come back. This guy here, he has yet to even go. Who knows if he comes back? This guy has been and come back. What you want to get from him is how many times have you gone and come back? Yeah. And what did you learn when you were there? What was the journey like to the battle? What was it? What was the battle like? What was the journey back from the battle? Wh- how did? How is it you're standing in front of me right now? Because that's the guy that you want to emulate. Those are the men, and that is why every time I always hear right now we're in the middle of a of a big one with another one of our friends in ministry down in Texas yeah. that I respect. I respect him so much. Yeah. I look at every single time that comes up. I'm looking at it going, cool. He he went to the battle, but he he also he also came back. I, I have things that I want to learn from him still. Yeah, you have to remember something. God uses all of our sides in life. God uses our mm-hmm. bright sides, and God also uses our dark sides. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the media makes our dark sides look big, but you have to remember sometimes God uses our shade. Our shade. Mm-hmm. He uses our dark side to make things happen. Oftentimes, we we believe that God only uses the positive part of our life. But as much negative there is in whoever's life, I have seen that God will use the negative part of your life to help other people move forward in life, mm. to help other people make different decisions in life, to help other people get realigned in life. So if God used a person in a really big way, in a positive way, and then all of a sudden you're something, oh my goodness, they... They, they, they had a crisis, a moral crisis, and that becomes the big thing now in their life. Just know this. As much as God used them when they were on the top of the mountain, is as much as God's using them on 100%. the bottom of the valley. 100%. He's just using them in a different way. 100%. Because the reality is God doesn't waste a part of your journey. Right. He will use the bright side of you, but he'll also use the dark side of you. Right. And so right now, unfortunately... Um, Dark sides of people's lives are being uh, emulated and, well, you know, uh, exposed. But just know this. As they're being exposed, God is even using that to use their life to help other people in a way they probably couldn't use them. 
when they're on the bright side. Right. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's because so so spiritual warfare is one thing. Let's let's talk about because every every battle has a genesis and has an impetus, and it starts with the formation of the two sides. There has to be a there there's there's opposing forces. Yeah. There has to be a beginning to that that. That those opposing sides. Let's talk about the beginning of the opposing sides because there are a lot of people out there that will say, "Oh, yeah, I mean, I believe there's a God." Quick story: I was speaking at somewhere in Virginia, and I, the the guy that had me come in and speak was the superintendent of the schools, the public schools, and he was retiring that day, the last day of school, and it was a public school. He said, "I want you to come and speak at the school, and I want you to do the gospel message." I said, "A gospel message? Isn't that wrong?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm retiring. What are they going to do? Fire me?" I was like, my man, let's go. So we went in there and I did this this whole gospel presentation. All these hands went up in the auditorium afterwards and the kids afterwards were so excited. They wanted to come down and meet me. And there's this kid about four back and he's like looking around. He's like trying to, he's like trying to make eye contact with me so he can mean mug me. 15 year old kid, which at the time I was probably what, 35. And I was just like, you're not going to intimidate. I, I don't know. <laughs> and so he finally gets to me and he says, I didn't raise my hand. I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, would you want to step aside? The young lady behind you would like to like to talk with me. He's like, I said I didn't raise my hand. I said, I said I heard you. Now, if you'll please step aside, <laughs> you can go on with your life. I mean, that, I'm not trying to force anybody into a belief system here. I said that I didn't raise my hand, and what he wanted was a, he wanted a dialogue. So I said, okay, I'll I'll, I'll play. I said, let's start with you have a you you are you are you, sorry uh, oh how did i say it because i said you you have parents at home is this where this began he said yeah my mom and dad said there's no god i said okay so you and your family are atheists yeah so your mom and dad are atheists you aren't he said well, why not i'm like you have to be 18 to be an atheist and, <laughs> well i'm like i'm kidding dude don't hurt yourself don't hurt yourself so already ram one u zero so i'm already waiting on this I said, so let's 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 say you're 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 an atheist, okay? This this big huge red brick wall. So it's your typical public high school auditorium with the red brick wall on the, on the side. I said, let's say rep, that represents all the knowledge in the universe. How much of that do you know? He said, half the wall. I was like, half the wall. Wow, that's that's sporty. Uh, me, I, you know, I'm just a dumb 35 year old. I know half a brick, but in that, I know basic math. I know my colors. I know the alphabet. <laughs> I know some of the basics of life. I know that that my my body will breathe involuntarily. My heart will beat involuntarily. I know that my thoughts are intentional. I've kind of broken things down a little bit, but that's that's in my half a brick. So can we agree that maybe half a brick is where we should both live? He's like, okay, fine, half a brick. I said, got it. Outside of your half a brick, is there a God? He was like, well, no. I'm like, ah, you only know your half a brick. Outside of your half a brick, is there a God? He said, well, I don't know. I was like, there we go. I now upgrade you to agnostic. Now, if you will please step aside and let the lady. <laughs> so that night he shows up at the youth event that I'm speaking at. And him and his dad show up, wow. sit right in the front row. This kid gets, he gets saved. I mean, I mean, it was a transformation. I get a letter about, I'd say eight, nine years later, I get a letter, an email. And and it's this this kid. He called it the, the the subject was red brick wall kid. And I knew right away who it was. And he said to me, he said, um, I want to let you know that because you took the debate, because you faced me that day, and then poured into me that night again, he said, I has has changed my life. I graduated high school. I went on to Bible college. I became a youth pastor. My parents are now both believers. I have a family of my own now. That is, he goes, all because you took that time. And I didn't want to respond with with oh, this big, huge, flowery letter. I just said, hey, man, hey, God is good. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. That's pretty much all I said. And I said, if you ever need me, you, you know you know where to find me. The thing is, is that the enemy is this, is this, uh, is this force that wants to rob us of our young people. And I believe that that comes from, because you're always going to worship something. 
young people, it's where you learn how to worship in your youth. Why is he so interested in what it is that you worship and when you start? It's because of his origin. And that origin is in heaven as the praise and worship leader of heaven. So I wanted to ask you about the beginnings of of Satan. Where does Satan come from? Because a lot of people think that it is just, there is just bad out there. It doesn't really have a a father to the bad. There's no real reason for the bad. It's just there. So it's like, well, if there's no bad, then how can there be good? You have, you have to judge the good against something. So I wanted to have you let you run on that one and just see. Well, if, if I take the biblical posture, the reality is Satan existed in heaven and he was able to convince a whole portion of heaven to follow him down to earth. So I want you to just think about a third of the angels decided in heaven, in the presence of God, I can strategically take these angels with me. That is the origin of our enemy. So very manipulative, very political, very argumentative, very keen, very crafty, intelligent, well aware of the human psyche, well aware of how to move people emotionally. He's a worship leader. So he knows, and he has been the leader of watching, we don't know how many angels, worship God and not him. Mm -hmm. So our enemy, to understand him, he is the most frustrated, vile, wicked, heartless, loveless entity, person, on the earth. Mm. Satan doesn't know love. He can never show love. Satan cannot bring life to anything. He can only bring death. Mm -hmm. Satan does not have understanding nor compassion, nor can he. It's all been stripped from him. Yeah. So any form of love, compassion, belief in you is a farce mm -hmm. because it's not founded in truth. Yes. It's all a lie. So your, your our enemy, the enemy of our soul, the enemy of our destiny, the enemy of our country, the enemy of humanity has studied humanity from its origins and knows the only way I can destroy humans is through humans. Yes. So this is what he did. He said to Eve, not to Adam, because Satan's number one strategy to bring down the first man was through a woman. Mm-hmm. Adam's yes. love and respect for Eve allowed Eve to influence his thinking and his destiny. Mm. So women may not want to hear that, but the reality is the first male that was brought down by the enemy was through a woman. The first person to be brought down was a woman. The first thing that he said to the woman is, you can be like God. Adam had no interest in being like God. He walked with God every day. He was happy being Adam. Adam had no interest knowing the difference of good and evil. He was happy with the knowledge that he acquired through naming all the animals, naming all the plants, understanding how the ocean stops at a certain place. Adam was happy. He was content with the knowledge that he was ascertaining from walking with God in the garden. Yeah. But Adam knew, I cannot get man directly. I have to get him Satan. indirectly. Yeah. So here is the thought. Your enemy as a man will always come through something indirectly. It's either a woman. It's either money. It's either knowledge. It's either power. Satan can will never go directly to you. He'll always use something outside of you mm -hmm. that he knows you have a desire on the inside to conquer. Yeah, so ask yourself this question. Let me just say this, Jeff. You want to know spiritual warfare? Ask yourself what on the inside of you is still a great desire in you. Mm -hmm. That is what he's going to use to go after you. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus said, in the book of John, he said, the enemy is coming, but he can find nothing in me. Mm -hmm. He was saying that to the disciples. And what he was saying is, 
the devil is going after me, but he knows there's nothing in me that he can find. The only way we can truly overcome our enemy is by being ruthlessly honest about the unmet needs we have, yes. the unmet uh, desires we have, the longings we have, and be honest with them about God and say, God, I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be popular. I want to be healthy. I want to be wealthy. I want the best looking woman. I want the nicest car. I want the nicest life. So God, that's where my heart is. When you can be that honest with God, God says, oh, okay, let's start working on those issues. What happens to us and we say, oh, no, no, I don't want to be famous. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to be wealthy. No, no, I don't want to be healthy. No, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be a beautiful woman. No, 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 I don't want to be honored and respected. The moment we deny those authentic deeds in us, mm. the enemy goes, that's what I'm going to touch. Yeah. So one of the best, so let me say this. There is no spiritual warfare where there is brokenness and humility. Mm. Whenever a man, has been broke, is walking in brokenness and in humility, transparency, vulnerability, there's no warfare. Why? Because he's not thinking of himself anymore. He's not thinking about his needs, his wants, his desires. He's thinking about others. You talk to a man that's been broken in life. There's a pause in him. If things don't go his way, he's like, it's okay. It'll work out. If people don't treat him right, ah, it's okay. God will make up those friends. If he loses money, he says, ah, it's okay. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. If someone walks out on him in his life, he says, ah, it's okay. God has another plan. You literally become untouchable because you transcended the needs of man. I know that's kind of deep. And I know it went deep. But I've been working as a pastor with humanity for 25 years and watching people make good decisions, bad decisions, watching myself make good decisions and bad decisions, I've come to the conclusion that the enemy always uses and entices us through our own desires. In fact, that's what the book of James says. Let no man say that he is tempted by God. God does not tempt man, but man is tempted by his own desires. Yes. So watch the desire that is lurking in you. Mm. That's probably what he's going to feed. Mm. Yes. You know, well, it's it's that it's so good, and and that this is the type of stuff that people aren't talking about. Well, you know, it's yeah. it's it's just it's it's there are a handful of platforms out there that you might you might hear something like this, but for the people out there that dabble in God, yeah, they dabble in God. They they dabble with their relationships with their you know to them God is that celestial Santa Claus says you know what God if you get me out of this I'll never do this again okay well that desire to do that one thing isn't being dealt with so of course you're going to do it again and that's not fooling anybody you're definitely not fooling God and God's like listen that's not how well that's the reason why the Bible says and I'll just say this for everyone who doesn't read the Bible the Bible says when you're weak that's when you're strong it's a mm. paradox. God is a paradox, and he lives in the paradox. See, we think God is all right, but God's like, no, I'm right, and I'm left. It just depends on where I am. When Joshua came and, and, and encountered the angel— When you say right, you mean politically. Both. Both. Yeah, yeah, got it. Both political, both morally. Yeah. Remember, God dwells in darkness, and he dwells in light. Mm -hmm. He dwells in both places simultaneously. That's why David said, if I make my bed in hell— there. If I ascend to the highest of heavens, Psalm one thirty nine, and so, yeah, so yeah. God, He consumes all light and darkness simultaneously yes. because He's outside of it. So He could jump in to the junk with you. He'll go to the bar with you, as He went to the church with you the day before. Mm -hmm. God will go walk with you as you're on your way to the dealer's house. When the day before you were on your way to God's house, God is not intimidated by evil. He lives outside of it. So when you go there, he goes, okay, is this where we're going? Because I'm going with you. Why? Because I made a covenant promise to never leave you or forsake you. Mm. So I'm with you. Other people, if you go to the dark side, oh, I can't go there. But God says, okay, if that's where you're going, then we're going. 
No, God, I don't want you here. God says, oh, no, I made a covenant promise. So when you understand, first of all, that God is with you in your lowest, darkest, as well as in the glorious, highest, you begin to understand he is your only escape out of darkness mm. because he is the only one that has the power to crush darkness. And he did it when he put Christ on the cross. When when God put Christ on the cross, he canceled darkness's power over humanity. Jeff, let me just say this. If I say this and I never got on your podcast again, if people remember this, the power of darkness has already been dismantled, hmm. overcome. Mm-hmm. When Jesus was on the cross, he absorbed all of humanity's wickedness, every possible sin that will ever be cr- committed. There is no creative new sin that a person will commit that has not already been absorbed on. on the cross of Christ. And so the power of darkness has been broken. Sin no longer has dominion over mankind when we say yes to Jesus. Mm-hmm. When I say yes to Jesus and ask him to come into my life and I openly confess my sin, he transfers heaven's righteousness to me, heaven's holiness to me, heaven's strength. But it only enters through the door of transparency. Mm-hmm. Jesus said, to find your life, you have to lose it. But if you lose your life for me, you'll find it. There's the paradox. Mm -hmm. The more that I am honest about my weaknesses. So I tell people, don't pray away your problems. You'll never get them out of your life. Confess your way out of your problems. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the difference? When I pray, God, help me with my weakness, is not the same confession like, God, I am weak, help me. I confess my sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. That's 1 John 1, 9. Mm -hmm. So confess where you're at. God, I feel like smacking my kids. God says, okay, that's honest. I felt like that before. God, I I feel like Any, any parent has going back into drugs because I can't handle the pressure. God says, okay, uh, Jesus was tempted in all ways. I understand that temptation. He even said to the Father, Father, get me out of this if it's all possible. I don't want to drink this cup. So yeah, okay, I understand what it is to want pleasure in the midst of your pain. What else? Mm-hmm. The moment I confess to God my weaknesses, he says, thank you. Let's do the exchange. You confess to me all your insanities. I'll, con- I'll deposit in you all of my strength, my righteousness, holy desires. But here is the... The condendrum, is that the way you say it? Darkness and light cannot coexist. Mm. So either you're honest about your darkness so light can come in, or you keep your darkness, but light won't come in. Oil and water cannot mix. Right. So I have to be honest about my dark side so that God can fill me with his light. Mm. So where I can only live with light to the degree that I no longer want my darkness. Mm. So that's the reason why you can be really good in one area, but so broken in another area. Yeah. You could be really good with money, but just broken with fight with relationships. Yeah. You could be so good with relationships and money, but so difficult when it comes to forgiving people. Mm. Because until you expose it all, yeah, the enemy has a hook in you. Yeah. So if we're going to win this battle in warfare, let's admit, let's look at our weaknesses and let's look at where we're vulnerable Mm. and let's give those to God and trust him. Yeah. And it's in that moment, the Bible says, when you're weak, he'll be strong. You mentioned forgiveness at the end of that. Yeah. And forgiveness, I think is people who, who can't step into forgiveness it's almost as though they are, they're not forgiving is against that other person. They're, they're, they're 
there, I'm not going to forgive you because I think in my mind, in my human finite mind, me not forgiving you is hurting you somehow. But forgiveness isn't there for the person who has offended. The, the, the forgiveness is there for the person, uh, the, the, the offender. That forgiveness is there for the, offend, the offended. Because when you don't forgive, there is that seed of bitterness that gets planted. And when that gets planted, it grows into a big, huge tree that's going to produce fruit. That guess who gets to eat it? So being able to forgive and being able to walk in forgiveness, understanding that as transactional. I always told my kids when they were, when they were little, the... One of the, the, the three most healing things that you can say to any human being isn't the three words, I love you. It's not any other uh, um, concoction of those words. It is really simple. It's on the humility side of things, true humility side. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And doing it in that order because it's a crescendo to a biblical understanding. I'm sorry, it's what the world knows as an apology. I was wrong. I know the difference between right and wrong, and I know that I was wrong. But will you forgive me means I understand the biblical standard by which those other two are touching on just briefly, but in the full understanding of the cross and true forgiveness, knowing that I'm always going to do something wrong. You're going to do stuff that's wrong, but God is going to forgive us. And that's why it says in Matthew, he says, he says, uh, our father, pray like this, not don't pray this, pray like this. Here's your template. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass. Forgive us our, forgive us our sins. I'm glad this is being recorded. As we forgive those who sin against us. Jeff, I am so glad this is being recorded. And that this is going to be able to be seen over and over. Again. Yes. Because what you just described, I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe forgiveness that way. It's, it's, it, is, it is transactional. In other words... I'm going to be doing wrong and requiring forgiveness, right? I am going to be requiring forgiveness from from God, but that same thing. It's not. It's and and by just saying the thing like that, you ever hear this? I will never forgive my wife for what she did. I will never forgive this person over here for what they said about me. I will never forgive this person over there because of the way that they treated me at this certain time. You are giving the enemy legal bounds and and reins and control over which to con- continue to maintain control over that area of your life of unforgiveness. Having that seed is going to grow quickly into a tree that's going to produce bitter fruit and unforgiveness. And getting rid of that, you have a better chance of getting a heroin off of his drug than you do ridding somebody of unforgiveness of that level. That's why you have to be vigilant in yeah. early stages of it, but it is transactional. It's I need forgiveness from God, not before or after I forgive somebody for offending me. I have to offend because it's transactional. It's happening at the same time. It's not, we'll forgive your transactions. I'll forgive you your sins before or after you forgive the sins of others. It says, as we forgive those who sin against us. It is transactional. It is not, there is not, it is not associated with time. So, when you said when you said forgiveness a minute ago, I said I have I have never placed forgiveness in the whole entire arena of spiritual warfare. But the enemy uses unforgiveness so many times as the weapon that he is going to shoot at us with. Remember that time that you were offended? Remember that time that person said something about you? Remember when they withheld this from you? So when a person thinks that, this is key. Because we're gonna think those things. Mm-hmm. It's at that moment. You have to put on the mind of Christ 100%. and say, yeah, you're right. They did hurt me. Yeah, you're right. That really hurt, hurt my feelings. Yeah, you're right. That really broke our bond and has really hurt my future. The moment you agree with the pain, yeah. you disarm the enemy. That's why Jesus said, if you have something against someone, Go quickly and settle your case before you get to court, lest your enemy say it to the judge and the judge makes you pay for for what you did. So 
You want to settle the case with the enemy as quickly as possible. The enemy says, you're a failure. Yeah, you know what? So when the enemy says, oh, Sergio, uh, you're a failure. Yeah, I failed in some things. You're right. Yeah, it sucks. Oh, uh, Sergio, um, uh, you're not responsible. Hi, you're right. There's sometimes I'm just so flaky. You're right. Oh, uh, Sergio, uh, sometimes you're heartless. Well, oh, you're so right. Sometimes I just lack compassion. The moment I agree with him, I disarm him. Uh. When you struggle to forgive someone and you say, I don't want to forgive them. I don't need to forgive them. What you're really doing physiologically, you're creating cancer cells in your body to start. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure, issues in your heart, issues in your blood. Mm -hmm. Physiologically, your body starts to change. Yes. When you say, I will not, you absorb. The moment you say, I will, you release. When you forgive, you are agreeing with God that they need forgiveness. And you are agreeing that in that moment you will function as God functioned with you. You will forgive. The moment you choose not to forgive, you are disagreeing with God and saying, I will not be like you in this moment. Mm -hmm. And the moment you do that, then you absorb all the negative energy, all the root of bitterness that is equate that it comes with that equates that comes with that statement. I will not forgive. And immediately you absorb it. So that's the reason why forgiveness helps you first mm -hmm. more than it helps the other person because unforgiveness is like drinking the poison and hoping that it kills the other person that's right so that's why when you ask for forgiveness from god there's always a response from god i will forgive you but who are you going to forgive today god forgive me of my sins today god says okay but who are you going to forgive because unless you forgive why do you want me to forgive that's colossians chapter 3 that's the reason why Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, as you're standing to pray against the mountain, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Because unforgiveness is one of the primary reasons why the blessing of God ceases to flow in our families. Yeah. I also do. It's, it's, there's, if, if you, if, when you come across somebody who is able to forgive and forgive quickly, they are, they are somebody who has a healthy life they're yes. happy. Yes. They are able to let things go. They're uh, it's it's almost as though uh, they're it's it's like the the tree that sits next to a river is going to always be a more fruitful and flourishing tree than one that sits by a pond. Yes. You know, and so watching that watching you just watching things moving through someone's life and they're just like, Yep, yeah, you know what I had I had Clark Bartram on here and he said people are in your life for a reason a season or a lifetime yeah. and being able to determine which one of those it is. And sometimes they're there for a season and sometimes it's time for them to move on. And when they leave, you can't allow some of those attachments to remain. Sometimes you just have to, and some of those attachments are going to be unforgiveness. Some people just are moving through your life. They're there for a season. And if you aren't, if you aren't able to detach from them fully, now you're going to be going through life with a bunch of parasitic drag that's on you. That is going to be residual of that relationship. And that can be in soul tie form. It can be in some kind of financial form. It can be in so many different areas. But a lot of people, they just, they, they're, they're, they're spiritual hoarders. They're relational hoarders. They're just, they're just holding on to everything that they can instead of walking in lordship where everything can be just exposed to God at all times, you know? And so, wow. um, I, um, Pastor Sergio, um, how can people find you? You can go to Pastor Sergio DLM, David Larry Martha, at gmail.com. There's my email if you want to email me directly. Uh, and also, you can go to Pastor Sergio at Instagram, uh, Pastor Sergio on TikTok, and I think as well as Facebook. Okay. Um, before we go, because we went there today. Yeah. Um, to the people who are watching, I mean, I'm just, let's just finish going there. To the people who are watching, who have, who, who don't know Jesus, or maybe have heard of him, 
or maybe they've been avoiding him. Yeah. Or maybe that there's just been they 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 haven't had a they haven't seen a real need to have this in my life. But today we've pointed to some things that are in most people's lives that they don't even really realize that are there or are a problem. Things that people can point at and say, I have been through this and now I understand what that impetus was. What was the start of it? And so I want to see if you will talk to these folks and explain Jesus. And there are going to be people watching this who don't know Jesus, who just need someone just to lead them through it and then pray them in. Sure. Uh, Would you be willing to do that for us? Absolutely. So for everyone that's watching, here's the first thing that I've learned. Let's repeat this prayer together. It's the same prayer I prayed. Changed my life. Me too. It's a prayer of salvation. So it's a step of faith. Everything we're going to say, we're going to say by faith. Believing that God will be true to his word. Repeat after me. Dear God, today I ask you to please forgive me for all of the sins that I've committed. I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day for me. Today, I open my heart and I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, to be my Lord and my Savior. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to empower my life, to transform me from the inside out. I pray this prayer from the bottom of my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to say be the first to welcome you into this new life that doesn't get any easier. It doesn't, it's not any harder, any easier. It doesn't quantify that way. It's just that you're not alone. Humans are going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. Pastor Sergio might even let you down, but God will never let you down. I know this has been a little bit of a, a little bit of a heavier episode. This is something that you guys probably weren't expecting, but that's why I had Pastor Sergio in here today just to want to shake things up a little bit. And also because we're coming to the end of things where we need to understand the importance of leading the kind of life that God has always ordained, has identified, has destined and called you to live. And that's what this is about. So even if you didn't pray the prayer, then there is something else I want you to do. I want you to sit in a quiet place at some point, maybe tonight while you're in bed and just think, just say, and 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 I want you to say this prayer. Say, you know what, God? If you're real, I want you to show yourself to me in a way that I will understand you. And then I want you to put on your five-point harness, put on your helmet, because it's about to get real, because he responds to that prayer. He is going to grab you by the ears, and he is going to stare you in the face, and he is going to look you in your soul, and you are going to recognize him as somebody, as something, as a life partner, as somebody who's never going to let you down. You're, and, then, and then all you do is you watch this episode again and pray this prayer that Pastor Sergio just did at the end and it will it will change your life it will change the way you look at relationships it will change the way that you do business in your head and in your heart until next time we get to hang out thanks for being here with us at Bram Radio stay dangerous <laughs>